Hey everyone. Most, actually all of my previous videos have had a lot to do with space and space travel. So for this video, I thought we'd bring things down to earth a bit. Two of the most significant tasks facing humanity today are to fulfill the basic needs of every human, especially in the so-called third world, and ensuring that our energy supply comes from renewable sources. Now, these two tasks are of course very closely related, though the first will likely involve massive political changes which I will not go into detail on. In this video, I want to talk about how we could utilize renewable energy to provide enough power to give everyone on Earth a decent living standard. I'll also touch on food production and water use, which are of course required to fulfill humanity's basic needs. Of course, it's extremely difficult to predict the specifics of how our infrastructure will look in the future, but for this video, I'll use a hypothetical situation. According to UN population projections, there will be around 11.2 billion humans living on Earth in 2100. Let's say in our world, we want every human being to have access to the same amount of energy as the average person in the United States does today. Unfortunately, the current global average is far lower than this. The average power usage per person in the USA is 9.5 kilowatts per year. If we want to provide 11.2 billion people with this much power, our infrastructure will need to generate 106.4 terawatts per year. Now for context, global energy consumption in 2018, which is the most recent data I could find, was 18.4 terawatts. Most of this comes from non-renewable sources as well. To achieve our hypothetical target, we'll need to increase energy production by almost a factor of six and make it as close to completely renewable as possible. Producing six times more energy sounds like a lot, but lucky for us, technological advancement can often be exponential. World energy consumption increased 14.1 times between 1900 and 2010, so if we keep up those growth rates, we'll far surpass a factor of six increase by the end of the century. So let's look at some forms of renewable energy which we already use extensively today. One of the oldest of these is hydropower. In 2012, the energy production capacity from hydropower was around 990 gigawatts, which is only a little over 5% of our total energy production. Thing is, there are a huge number of rivers, streams, and creeks from which we could draw energy, but aren't. I found a study on PLUS One, I'll link it in the description, which attempts to calculate the energy we could get from hydropower if we use literally every available source on the planet. The resolution of the data is pretty impressive. The smallest hypothetical power plant they use only produces a kilowatt of power, meaning that it would take almost 10 of these to hit that 9.5 kilowatt goal for one person. These tiny power plants only let through a tenth of a cubic meter of water per second, which falls for only a meter before transferring its gravitational potential energy to the turbines. This seems almost too small to be practical, but the study is simply seeking to find the theoretical maximum amount of power we could squeeze out of every bit of running water on Earth. Using all of these sources, the total power output adds up to 5.94 terawatts. That's a significant percentage of our current energy use, but pretty small compared to our target of 106.4 terawatts. Of course, it's also very unlikely that we'd actually utilize every single source for hydropower. For our purposes, though, we'll assume that our hypothetical future civilization will only construct what the study classifies as large plants in every possible location. It's likely that a few smaller plants would be built, but also that there may be some possible locations for large plants where plants aren't built, so we'll assume that those cancel out. The study says that 68% of the available energy from hydropower will come from what it calls large plants. That's around 4.04 terawatts of power. Again, this is pretty insignificant compared to the total amount of power we'll need, though it's certainly useful. So, what other sources of power are on the table? There are a couple that are quite a bit better in terms of yield. One of these, as you might have guessed, is solar power. How much energy could we harness from that? This really boils down to how many solar panels you're willing to build. One of the most efficient types of solar panels available today are monocrystalline solar panels, which can have an efficiency of 22 to 27 percent. This means that around a quarter of the electromagnetic energy that hits them is turned into usable electricity. However, another type called thin film solar panels are most commonly used in large-scale solar power plants today. They are cheaper but less efficient, with an efficiency between 15 and 22 percent. However, the gap in efficiency between these and more expensive types of panels is rapidly shrinking. I think it's safe to assume that by the end of the century, we'll be able to mass-produce solar panels of either variety with an efficiency of 25%, which I'll use for our approximations. So with this in mind, how many solar panels would we need to reach our goal? Under standard test conditions, which assumes an irradiance of 1000 watts per square meter, our hypothetical panels would produce 250 watts per square meter. To produce 100 terawatts of power, we would therefore need 400,000 square kilometers of solar panels. 
Now, this is only 0.27% of Earth's land area and would fit well within the 19% of Earth's land, which is so-called barren land, this being deserts, salt flats, and other non-usable but non-glacial land. The determining factor here is not room, but the cost of manufacturing solar panels. This cost has been dropping drastically, especially during the last decade, with the global average price of installation dropping by more than half between 2014 and 2018. These prices are still obviously far too high to get anywhere close to producing even our current energy output with solar alone, but we'll always have other methods to rely on, and the cost situation should improve by the end of the century due to increasing the scale of production and general advancements in technology. There's also the possibility of building power satellites in orbit which beam energy down to Earth. The main advantage of these is that when placed in the right orbit, they can receive energy consistently without worrying about nighttime or clouds. Of course, lowering launch costs will be imperative to making such plans economical, and it's likely that a combination of Earth and space-based solar will be used in our future energy grid. Now, of course, this wouldn't be a video about energy production in the future without discussing nuclear fusion. Fusion is often seen as a total game-changer when it comes to technological advancement, one that can bring us automatically into a golden age of prosperity. The extent to which this is true will depend on how low we can get the cost of constructing fusion power plants, and how high we can get the ratio of output to input energy. The most common fusion reactor design, which you've probably seen pictures of, is called a tokamak. Tokamaks use strong magnetic fields to compress superheated plasma in a torus-shaped reaction chamber, creating the necessary conditions for nuclear fusion. Because of how difficult it is to predict the efficiency and cost of future nuclear reactors, we'll look at what's probably the most famous current design. The ITER, or International Experimental Thermonuclear Reactor, is a collaborative effort between seven countries and seeks to be the first tokamak reactor to produce net energy. Current experimental reactors produce energy through fusion, but they require more energy input than they can get out. ITER wants to produce 500 megawatts of thermal power for 20 minutes with a 50 megawatt power input. In other words, to produce a tenfold gain in power. However, ITER will not be capable of turning this thermal energy into electric power. That job will be given to its plant successor, DEMO. DEMO will produce around 2 gigawatts of power, around 25 times its power input. It'll act as a sort of stepping stone to an even more advanced design called PROTO, which will be the first prototype of an actual nuclear fusion power plant. PROTO, which like its predecessors will fuse deuterium and tritium plasma, is planned to have a power output of 4.5 gigawatts. Now let's imagine that PROTO is similar in capability to your average nuclear power plant around the year 2100. How many power plants would we need to reach our goal of 106.4 terawatts? Doing the math and rounding up, we find that we'll need 23,645 PROTO-type reactors. For context, there are currently around 2,425 coal-fired power plants in the world, around 10 times less. I suppose it makes sense that you need more plants to get more power. Of course, we're assuming that power plants at the turn of the next century will only be as powerful as the first prototype, while they will probably be a great deal more powerful. Again, whether fusion will become viable will also come down to cost. $20 billion are expected to have been spent on ITER by the time it operates at full power. Things are always more expensive the first time around, but time will tell how far down we can bring that price tag. So, those are the main sources of power we will likely be able to rely on in the future. However, traditional nuclear fission power plants will certainly have a place in our future power grid. What many people don't realize is that it is nuclear power which has done the most, with the exception of hydropower, to reduce our carbon footprint, and that fission produced 10.2% of our power in 2017. If fusion power becomes commonplace in the future, then fission reactors will essentially be rendered obsolete, but until we get fusion, fission will remain a very important power source. One development that we will likely see with regards to fission reactors in the coming years is at least a partial switch to liquid fluoride thorium reactors, or lifters for short. Thorium, whose atomic mass is only slightly less than uranium's, is quite a bit more abundant in nature than traditional uranium-235 fuel. Lifters also generate less nuclear waste than traditional uranium-based reactors in use today, and this waste decays to acceptable levels of radioactivity in only around 300 years compared to tens of thousands of years for current designs. Lifter reaction chambers are also unpressurized, which makes them safer than current reactors which are highly pressurized to keep the water inside from turning into steam. However, the tech necessary for lifters in the thorium fuel cycle is still in the works. There are several other methods of power generation that I haven't mentioned here, like wind and geothermal power, but we'll save those for later videos. Energy is an absolute necessity if we want to enjoy the conveniences of modern technology. But there are other necessities, 
like food, which we can make radical improvements on the production of. I was actually really surprised the first time I saw statistics on how our planet's land is used today. I found the stats for the first time when I was researching for a paper I was writing for college, but for this video I went and found some better graphics. So, out of all of Earth's land, 71% is habitable to life on a scale beyond microbes or particularly tough cacti. Out of this, half is used for farmland. If you've ever looked out of an airplane window, this shouldn't be too surprising based on how much of what you see is farm fields of some kind, though 50% is still surprisingly high in my opinion. Even more surprising, 77% of farmland, over three quarters, is used for animal agriculture, either for animals to graze on or to grow the grain to feed these animals. Without even considering the ethical issues surrounding animal agriculture, this is terribly inefficient. As this chart shows, the proportion of both calories and protein that we get from meat and dairy is far lower than the proportion of farmland used to produce it. In recent years though, the technology of lab-grown meat has been rapidly improving. While the first lab-grown burger, produced in 2013, cost over $300,000, three years later in 2016, a company produced a lab-grown meatball for only $1,000. Dr. Mark Post, the scientist behind the first lab-grown burger, believes that he could produce a burger for $10 if the process used was scaled up to industrial levels. With such rapid improvement in only a couple years, lab-grown meat could become cheaper than conventional meat eventually, certainly within a century with enough investment, and we're seeing no shortage of that now. Producing all of our meat synthetically would free up 77% of the Earth's farmland. In other words, 38.5% of Earth's habitable land to be restored to its natural ecosystem without humanity's living standards needing to drop. As it turns out, we don't have to stop at improving animal agriculture. Agriculture as a whole takes up more of humanity's water use than any other industry or activity, 70% to be specific. While replacing animal agriculture with synthetic meat and dairy would lower water use simply because of all the feed crops it would make unnecessary, there are improvements we can make to plant-based agriculture meant for human consumption that can lower water use as well. One solution to this is vertical farming. Instead of growing crops in outdoor fields, we could grow them inside climate-controlled buildings. Eventually, these could be made into towers that take up a pretty small amount of land area each, but grow a huge amount of food due to their height. Like many other things in this video, the technology is in its early stages. However, there are many vertical farms that currently exist around the world, such as the one at Aero Farms' headquarters in Newark, New Jersey, which features a crop yield per square foot that's 390 times higher than that of traditional farms. Aside from creating millions of new jobs if employed on a large scale and allowing food to be produced in urban centers near those who will consume it, vertical farming can cut water use drastically. The trick here is to grow food using either hydroponics or aeroponics. Hydroponics is a technique in which plants are grown from nutrient-filled water instead of soil. This can lower water use by a factor of 10 when compared to traditional farming methods. Aeroponics takes this a step further, replacing the soil with a nutrient-permeated mist which surrounds the plants' roots. According to NASA, aeroponics can lower water use by 98% compared to soil-based farming methods, which is around 5 times better than even hydroponic systems. Aeroponic systems also eliminate the use of pesticides and reduce the use of fertilizer by around 60%. Both of these methods also lead to faster plant growth rates. An example given by NASA in an article which I'll link in the description has to do with tomatoes. Aeroponic systems today can produce six tomato crop cycles, in other words, six batches of tomatoes from seed to fruit each year instead of two with traditional farming methods. All of these stats will only be improved on as time goes on and prices will drop as vertical farming efforts are scaled up. The end result with enough funding could allow us to restore the natural environments on half of Earth's habitable land and of course have better tasting food. Obviously, it will take a huge amount of ambition and investment to make all the technologies in this video widespread, but almost all of them exist today in some early form, and some are well past that stage. So let's take a minute to imagine what our world could look like at the end of this century when the use of these technologies is commonplace. The year is 2100. Earlier in the century, the warning signs of a climate catastrophe became too obvious for even the most stubborn business magnates to ignore, and in governments worldwide, factions which aggressively pushed to develop a sustainable and carbon-neutral power grid began coming into power. As the decades passed, improved energy infrastructure made revolutionary new agricultural techniques possible, which relied on indoor facilities to produce all kinds of foods far more cheaply than previously possible. Now, at the end of the 21st century, 
the total energy output of humanity's population of just over 11 billion has reached 110 terawatts, ranking them just above 0.8 on Sagan's modified Kardashev scale. Almost two-thirds of this comes from various types of nuclear fusion reactors scattered across the planet, some of which provide electricity to fledgling cities in the Antarctic. Most of the other third comes from massive solar arrays, mostly scattered across 120,000 square kilometers of the Earth's surface. Most are in major deserts, though some are near urban areas, and others are even located on large bodies of water. Hydroelectric dams have been built on nearly every large source of rivers worldwide. In total, they provide 4 terawatts of energy, which was an extremely valuable boost in the decades following their construction. However, since their power generation now pales in comparison to that of fusion and solar, there are plans to dismantle many of these for environmental reasons. In the countryside, traditional farming techniques are rapidly being replaced by vertical farming facilities located on the outskirts of urban centers. As a result, the amount of traditional farmland in use in 2100 is only one-third of what it was in the early 21st century. Agricultural land's share of Earth's habitable surface has fallen from 50 to 17 percent, allowing 34 million square kilometers to be re-terraformed in a sense, that is, returned to its pre-Anthropocene environment and placed under state protection. In addition to these benefits, the huge amount of water saved by hydroponic and aeroponic farming, together with egalitarian distribution methods, has eliminated scarcity of drinking water for virtually every human on Earth. In the following decades, traditional agriculture also comes close to disappearing entirely. Over 90% of animal protein is grown from stem cells in enormous automated factories, and an increasing number of governments are banning traditional animal agriculture entirely on ethical grounds now that another realistic option is available. This is the future that is possible if we constantly strive to prioritize scientific research and technological advancement for the purpose of benefiting all of humanity, not just certain small groups. If all goes well, this will be our future, and many of us will survive to see it. Thanks for watching, and remember, per aspera ad astra.